In this video, we're going to talk about the cost of inflation and how serious they are. Economists have classified various costs of inflation. In this video, I will only focus on the last three. Normally, in economies with stable and small levels of inflation, these costs are small. In economies with high levels of inflation, these costs can be large, large enough to cripple an economy. Let's see what they are. Let's start with a misallocation of resources from changes to relative prices. Your purchasing decisions depend on relative prices. When choosing between buying an apple or an orange, you compare their nominal prices. That exercise is ultimately about your opportunity cost. How much of each you buy is determined by how many apples you have to give up in order to get an orange. When there's inflation, firms don't all raise prices at the same time. So there may be times when the relative price of apples and oranges doesn't match the long run real price. Your choice of apples and oranges will change, not because there has been a change in the market for each, but due to the timing of price changes. Similarly, inflation can make certain investments more profitable than others, so the allocation of capital can get distorted. Misallocation of resources across the economy can lead to a large and persistent cost for the economy, getting worse as inflation increases. Okay, let's shift to tax distortions. In the short run, inflation makes nominal incomes grow faster than real incomes. Because taxes are levied on nominal income and are not adjusted to inflation, in the short run, you will pay more taxes in real terms than would otherwise. To understand this problem, let's work through an example and let's see this at work. In this active learning exercise, you are saving. In the United States, when you earn income from savings, you have to pay a tax on those earnings called capital gains tax. Like its name says, you paid the tax on an increase or gains, the difference between what you had before you put your savings in the bank and your ending balance when you withdrew your savings. So please read through this problem and answer questions A, B, and C on Top Hat. Please pause the video, sign into Top Hat, answer the questions, and then move along to see the answers. Okay, thank you for submitting your responses on Top Hat. Now, the deposit was $1,000. In case one, inflation was 0% with a nominal rate of 10%. Now, in case two, inflation was 10%, but the nominal interest rate was 20%. To calculate the growth of the real value of your deposits in both cases, we can look to our inflation of the real interest rate. So let's think about case one. The real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate minus inflation. And in this case, we have the nominal of 10% minus inflation of 0% gives us a real interest rate of 10%, meaning that the real value of your deposits increase by 10% um, during your deposit. Now let's think about case two. The real interest rate, again, is nominal minus um, inflation rate. That is 20% minus 10% gives us also 10%. So in real terms, both of those deposits grew at the same time. And this is because of the Fisher effect. We learned that nominal interest rates move one to one with changes in inflation rates. So let's think about taxes. Now your deposit of $1,000 at 10% interest would give you an interest income of $100. I guess 100 is 10% of 1,000. Now, the capital gains tax was 25%, so 25% of 100 is $25. So you end up paying $25 in taxes in case one. In case two, your nominal interest rate was 20%, and 20% of your deposit of 1,000 is gonna give us a $200 nominal gain. Now the tax rate is still 25%, so 25% uh, of 200 is 50. 
So you end up paying more taxes in nominal terms uh, when, in, uh, when inflation is high. Now, that's not the entire picture, so let's keep working through the cases. Because inflation is just a change in the measuring stick of the economy, uh, what we really want to know is whether the tax is um, large in real terms. One way to measure that is to look at the after-tax real interest rate for both cases. So first, we need to look at the after-tax nominal interest rate. Now, after taxes of $25 in the case one, um, our $100 become an after-tax earnings of $75. To get our nominal interest rate then after taxes, we take our gain of $75 and divide it by 1,000 to get 7.5%. So nominal terms after tax, we made 7.5% income. Now in real terms, what we can do is we can use the same equation as we did before to subtract the inflation rate out of that nominal interest rate and get what the real after-tax return has been. And in that case, because inflation was 0%, it is still 7.5%. So let's take a look at what happens when we have inflation. So when we have inflation, our nominal return is much higher. That's also because um, the, the nominal interest rate was higher. So we originally had a $200 gain we pay $50 in taxes, which leaves us an after-tax gain of 150, which turns out to be 15%. Now, that's really cool, you may think, but you have to remember that to look at the change in the purchasing power of that deposit, you have to subtract um, the, the inflation rate. So when we do that, you see that the after-tax return is only 5%. But why? Why is this difference between 5% in the case of inflation and 7.5%? Oh, that's the wrong one. And 7.5% when you look at the real return. That's because taxes are levied on nominal terms, right? So even though um, uh, even though your real income uh, remain, you know, constant in this case. Um, nominal income went higher and the government taxed you on a nominal but not real income. The result is that you end up with a real uh, rate of return that is lower uh, when inflation is high. So let's wrap it up. When there is inflation, uh, inflation increases nominal interest rates. And remember, we call this the Fisher effect, but not real interest rates. That increases savers' tax burdens, and it lowers the after real interest rate. That is important because by lowering the after tax interest rate, inflation reduces the incentive to save. And recall from the previous chapters that savings is critically important for the future of productivity and living standards. So inflation can cripple not just the present of an economy, but its future as well by limiting the accumulation of capital. Debt contracts are underwritten in nominal terms, just like we learned. So changes in inflation changes the interest rate. That will lead to arbitrary redistributions of wealth when there are unexpected changes in inflation. So let's delve into it. A higher than expected inflation rate means that creditors get a lower return on their lending. An experience in my family can help illustrate this point. I lived in Ecuador when the government decided to change the national currency to US dollars. That meant that all the currency in circulation, deposits, and contracts would be changed to dollars at a fixed exchange rate. When it was first announced, the market exchange rate was 10,000 sucres per dollar. My family had recently purchased a home and my dad had the choice of making the loan in dollars or sucres. 
The contracts were roughly the same, occurring exchange rates, but with different interest rates. He decided he would pay a higher interest rate, but take out the loan in Sucres. Now, let me write here a contract. Let's see, or draw a contract. And let's do a sign for Sucres just like that. And let's say that the contract was for one billion sucres. Remember, in Ecuador at this time we had a lot of inflation and the in, and the exchange rate was equal to 10,000 sucres for each dollar. Right? So in this case, if we were to think about this contract in dollars, it would have been $100,000. Now this was what most people expected. But months afterwards, um, when the details of the dollarization was announced, the government unexpectedly decided to double the exchange rate. So the official change would happen only shortly afterwards at 20,000 sucres uh, exchange for each dollar. So the exchange rate afterwards, and yeah, let's use a different color, exchange afterwards, oh, that's close enough, let's use green. The exchange afterwards happened at 20,000 sucres for each dollar. So the contract, remember, was still denominated in sucres. It's still one billion sucres, right? But as you're probably anticipated, anticipating, the mortgage cost in our house was halved overnight. The new contract, now in dollars, was for fifty thousand dollars my parents still had a claim on an asset that was worth more than their mortgage but their mortgage was halved um, what it was in nominal terms so think about it for a second lenders and anyone else in ecuador who owned financial assets denominated in sucres lost half of their wealth while old borrowers were forgiven half of their debt. As you can see, unexpected inflation can have significant, uh, significant effects on the distribution of wealth. 